use your thought process now. Just stay in the market and develop different um, platforms. So like the next acquisition, you know, logically could be like an HVAC company or a, a landscaping company that does the, the tree trimming. What What's the thought process as you're doing multiple businesses? Is it better to have like a platform in the same market, would you say? Yeah, so my goal, when I set out to do this, I, I'm, I'm the kind of a goal person, so I need to know roughly what I'm aiming at. Even if that goal moves or whatever, I need to know, like, this is directly where I'm heading. And so I set out, I had no no model of this in front of me, like anyone has done it, but I was like, I'm going to try and build a hold co of, um, you know, portfolio companies that do a combined 100 million in revenue. And again, revenue, I don't really care about revenue, it's a kind of a vanity metric but it's easily understood by people and it's just a nice round number and a good target. And so I guess I am doing what you, you're you suggesting, which is we will probably branch out into other types of home services, first and foremost, less construction, probably more home services that you know maybe can go to market together, but be part of kind of a master brand, a holding company that, and, and they'll probably primarily be in middle Tennessee is my assumption, but who knows? There's been some interesting opportunities. I always tell people it's really hard to do the first deal. It took me two years to kind of get to that point where I was able to jump in and do it. But once you've done one, you don't, you're don't. you not a tire kicker anymore. There's a lot of people in this space that say they want to buy businesses that probably never will. Mm-hmm. And so once you've done one, people bring you deals. That's just, just how it works. We're, all, we're talking about business acquisition. Everybody loves the thought of owning a business. But many of us don't have the skills yet to like figure out like what kind of business should we buy? How do you how do you define a buy box? Well, this gentleman comes from the corporate world where he did this on a on an institutional basis. Then he was like, wait, wait a second, I'm going to do this for myself. And then he became an investor. So we're we're talking to somebody that has the skill sets from both an institutional side, then transitioned into the investor side, and he's going to give us some some tidbits today about like buying businesses, what to look for. How do we develop our skills? Because it's not like you can just buy a business that's going to run itself. So we, we got to learn some skills like anything. But um, please welcome James to the show. And James is known as the Business Buying Brit. And I think you can go to his website, businessbuyingbrit.com. Learn more about him. He does have some training programs. If you're interested in buying businesses, you probably want to check that, that out. But welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, looking forward to our conversation. So uh, just give us a little bit background about like your experience in in like in the the corporate world what did you do and then at what point did you say wait a second i'm sick of making these big companies money let's do it for ourselves yeah so i spent 12 and a half years in the big four uh so i worked for price waterhouse coopers um and honestly it was it was great career um you know i'm I'm grateful for my time there Uh, I, i did the first couple of years in auditing uh which is kind of a rite of passage in the uk where where, you, where I started, and then I basically transitioned into restructuring and turnaround, where I spent the, the rest of that time. So I spent over a decade doing turnaround restructuring of companies. That can mean a whole variety of things. So um, it can be kind of like operational restructuring, um, but it can also be like more financial restructuring, like balance sheet type stuff as well. So I've actually done a mixture of all of it, a bit more operational in the UK. And then when I moved to the US uh, about eight years ago, I was started to do more balance sheet restructuring and financial turnaround, that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, you referenced, uh, you know, M&A deals and things like that. Uh, The M&A deals that I I did, uh, they were more in the distress world. So um, I I guess I did do some uh, financial diligence type work for like non-distressed a little bit. But for the most part, the deals that I did were like Chapter 11 related or and you can sell out of it called there's something called a section 363 sale and things like that. But I think I got to a point um, where ultimately it was a good career, but I was traveling a lot and I ultimately, my heart wasn't in it. And so I wanted to do this for, for, for years. I'd wanted to buy businesses for myself and I kind of knew how to, cause I'd seen all these transactions happen and I'd been responsible for a lot of the financial modeling and sources and uses and things like that for the deals I'd been involved in. Um, but then I still didn't have that like confidence, so that final piece of confidence just to leap out and do it for myself. So I finally took the leap uh, towards the beginning of 2022. So I've been a full-time investor for a year and a half, and uh, I'm still here. It's, it's going well. Um, I still don't have a job, 
And uh, yeah, so what I say to people is like, you know, there's a different kind of weight doing it for yourself. But uh, over the last year and a half, I've enjoyed work more than I've ever enjo enjoyed it before. My net worth has gone up. And I think the future looks incredibly bright. So I love what I do now. I don't get Sunday scaries anymore where I like Sunday comes. And I'm like, oh, no, I've got to go back to work tomorrow. It's like I actually re really enjoy it. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, a lot of people come to me. I, I work in the financing world. I also do some franchise consulting and when people want to buy a franchise. Um, but I also have a lot of people that come to me for SBA financing because they want to buy a business. They're like, hey, uh, I want to learn about SBA financing. And that's like. How, how the conversation starts and I give them an overview of like what SBA is and it is a good tool for certain type of business acquisitions. Um, so when you transitioned so far, you've, you've, you, you're, you own a portion of three different businesses and it looks like most of those business businesses are like trucking, retaining wall and roofing. So kind of like a ser service based blue collar type of businesses. So what about these industries attracted you? And, and then, Furthermore, like if somebody doesn't have your skills, like we don't, we're not spreadsheet nerds, right? I mean, we, we haven't done uh, repositioning of distressed assets. Where, where do we start? And I mean, I think most of the viewers are going to, they're going to be looking at Main Street type businesses, like 500,000 to 5 million, right? Range that do maybe a million or 2 million in top line revenue. So walk us through, like, if you weren't the, the brain you were, and you were, you know, an entrepreneur, but didn't have the say the skill sets. How do you how do you develop these skill sets? And then, furthermore, how do you find an ideal business that might make sense? Or can you partner with people that might have skills that you don't have? That's a lot is, of questions. That's a lot of good <laughs> questions there. So, like, steer me as as you want. Um, first of all, you gave me a good reminder. I have to update my website. Uh, because I don't, so we, we did the first two transactions, which was a retaining wall and the trucking company. There, that was one, one transaction, but two companies owned by the same seller. Then we moved on to roofing and then we did a paver manufacturing business. So like we make concrete pavers. They're the three main kind of operating businesses. Cause we rolled those first two together, the trucking into the retaining wall company. And then w we have, we've started to kind of get some stakes that are smaller, but like they're the, they're the main ones. Um, so let me, let me break down your questions and work out kind of where to go from here. I would say, first of all, you do not need my background. Absolutely not. Um, I think you just need to get educated on how to buy a business. It is a risky game. That is, there's no way to get around that. It's not like buying a single family rental, which has been there for 40 years and it will be there in 40 years time. Um, you're buying often a brand, a collection of people like, it's more fragile for sure. But at the same time, you know, like most people, my biggest fear when I first did it for the first time was like you buy a business and everyone leaves and then you're left with the debt. So that also doesn't happen um, really in practice. I actually, I've heard it maybe once uh, something that was a nightmare scenario like that. But also your worst fear probably isn't going to happen. So somewhere in the middle. And I think what you ultimately need is a roadmap. Um, it's, a, a, it's an aside from answering your question, but I started a five week live training course on this because I actually, my first transaction, uh, from my perspective, I didn't do it very well. I could have done it a lot better than I did. Um, so a part of my course is I'm trying to help people and coach people to be like, don't do what I did in the first deal. Um, and then, you know, every deal you get better, but in terms of breaking down the different parts, uh, you don't need my background. You just need to get educated somewhat. And I would, encourage you to get in the right circles where you're absorbing the right information like there's a lot of information uh, on instagram youtube just make sure your kind of inputs are just feeding you this stuff and you can learn over time um that that's a great starting point i do think my financial background helped but i think you can learn that but actually there's a lot of people that do very well in small business who have a sales background or other managerial you know experience that you don't have to have finance because actually some of the finance guys that come in then have to suddenly learn how to, how to have really hard conversations like HR questions or learn how to sell. And these are things that other people have experience in. So I always encourage people like you do have unique giftings to you. Like what are uniquely, what are you uniquely good at? And also what kind of opportunities are you uniquely seeing? Like everyone has, um, you know, 
things they do day to day that will give you a viewpoint into something that other people can't see. So for example, I heard the other day of a guy who was working for a trucking company and then he managed to like add on a, a business which was kind of somehow playing a middleman between like loading up the trucks and getting it to and from the warehouse or something that literally only he would have seen and he was able to do that business and it's a now viable business. So like there will be things in your life that you are seeing that other people won't get to see. So that's kind of way I like to start people thinking, like what are, what are those things that you know other people don't see? And then, stop me in a second, but partnerships you asked about as well. Partnerships is a really big deal for me. I do everything in partnerships. I have a strong belief that people go further in good partnerships than carrying the weight and rewards solo. Like, yes, of course, that you get more of the pie if you do it solo, but like, it's a long game, this, and you want to share that journey. And also, if you do get a big win, you kind of want to share the wins as well. Um, so it's kind of nice to share the hard times and the good times with someone. And I've, I've seen personally, I'd be interested in your thoughts, but I've seen the guys that win over the long term. They do everything in partnerships, and that's the model I'm trying to create as well. Yeah, I would agree, but I also think a lot of partnerships fail like because the expectations aren't set up correctly. So you, you like I, I was just on a call earlier today and, and it's happening like two partners are ousting one partner. So you, I agree that partnerships, cause I'm in some partnerships, uh, and, and just really understanding the relationship and the expectations from each of the partners is so critical. Like if you do that right, you're right. You're going to go 10 times further with the right partners. I just think a lot of people, excuse my French, get in bed with the wrong partner. And then that's where the problem. So vetting the partner and really having deep conversations of like, really like the expectations. Cause I think a lot of times what happens is there's over time, Oh, well, this partner's not holding their weight and they, they get like a chip on their shoulder and then that just starts brewing. So I, I do think you're going to get a lot further with partners, but you have to be very careful too. So that, how did, that's true. That's, that's how true. did you talk us through your first acquisition and how you how it was structured i know you didn't do it 100 percent right but sometimes we learn from our mistakes but how did that happen why that business and then kind of how you progressed and did the roll up and like that'd be interesting like the business you were doing bought what was it doing in revenue what what attracted it you to that business model and how were you able to grow it so far yeah so I'm going to rewind uh, just a, a couple more years. So I tried probably for about a couple of years to put together a deal that would allow me to buy a business and then leave my W2. And like it just hadn't happened. So I had a couple of opportunities. One was, you know, a great set of partners, but the opportunity was too small. So it wasn't really worth it. Another one was a, a good opportunity, but I didn't feel peace about the, you know, the person who had brought me the deal. And so, you know, I was kind of getting frustrated going into the beginning of 2022. Um, I'd been having more conversations with someone who was my private money lender at the time for my real estate deals. So the whole time I had my career, I was doing deals, but in the real estate space. As we got to know each other more, I'd kind of said, by the way, I'm going to stop buying real estate. I really want to buy companies because I feel like there's a huge opportunity here. We decided to go in together 50-50 and um, his background is in construction. And so because of that, we I was comfortable doing a construction company first, which is Retaining Walls. I don't think I would have done that deal by myself. Um, I always say people need to have knowledge of the industry or a desire to learn the industry. And whilst I, you know, I do of course have a desire to learn the industries I'm now a part of, I wasn't sufficiently qualified because uh, Retaining Walls are you do not want to get retaining walls wrong. You know, there's engineering and various other components that are super critical. So I wouldn't have done that by myself. So I was, I would say it was a product of speaking to people in the local market, business owners we knew to say, we're looking for, for, um, you know, for opportunities. And then this one came up. So I always say like, try and take advantage of the opportunity in front of you. Once this one came in, we did some analysis on it. And we felt that it, at the time, we felt that it met our buy box. So it was, you know, retiring seller, someone who wanted to move on to the next chapter of their life. It's a, you know, a leading installer of retaining walls in our local area. And so, and had good relationships. So, so we thought um, it has a bright future. It had a bright, bright future ahead of it. We bought it when it was doing about 3.4 million of revenue a year. 
and it's now at about four to four and a half million of revenue. I'm not sure where we're going to land this year, but it's, you know, a, a, certainly grown. How um, many employees? Uh, we have about uh, 12 in this, in this company at the moment. Okay. And, and so when you're analyzing it, 3.4 million um, at the time. And, and, and so I want to get inside the mind of you for a second. So like uh, I'm, I'm looking at top line revenue. I'm looking at obviously what's the, what's the net income, right? What is it net? And these type of business is, would have, you know, an, a margin of X, like where do we, what, what numbers are we looking at? I, top line really doesn't mean that much, right? Yeah. Cause it's really, uh, the, 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 the net, the net income. And then the other factor then that comes in is how we're arranging the debt. Cause we're going to have new debt and he probably doesn't have that much debt. And now we're taking, how do you, how did you look at the framework of this? Like, what was the margins? Like it was doing 3.4 and it was, you know, basically netting him 500,000 a year. And then how did you look at that with the new debt? Did you get SBA financing? Did the seller carry? What did that look like? So on, on all of our deals so far, we've done heavy seller financing between 60 and 100% seller financing on all the deals we've done. We were considering SBA and we may consider doing an SBA next year on a deal just because I, I like the scheme. I know it's out there and I, I feel like I'd like to go through the process of doing an SBA. But at the moment, like we've had these opportunities come to us and we've been able to talk to the seller. And it, what I'd love about seller financing is the creative aspect. So sellers genuinely, from my experience, do not always want a lump sum of money straight away. If they've run a business successfully for 10, 20, 30 years, they don't actually need a huge chunk of money in one go. They actually prefer it in many instances being paid out over time because they can save on capital gains tax and it's just better for them. Yes. Um, and so that, that has been my experience. People will say, oh, you can't do no money down deals. And like, yes, I, I don't want to be like some sort of guru preaching online, like buy companies all the time for no money down, but it is possible for sure. Um, I would say in terms of margins, I consider it, it's hard to give blanket answers because it depends on industries, but I consider 10% net income to kind of be almost like break even because there's a few things that come out after after net income, which I know is the bottom of the P&L. It doesn't factor in capital expenditure, doesn't factor in um, you know principal reductions or payments on debt and things like that, and taxes, of course. As, actually, you know, taxes above net income. But like, there's certainly a couple of things that it doesn't factor in. So I think of 10% being kind of break even to me. So I think 15% net income is healthy. And then again, I can't talk about gross margin across the board, across all industries, but certainly in like construction type businesses or like home services, construction for sure, like 25% gross margin is, you you definitely want 25 to 30%, I would say. And then in some home services, I think that needs to be a lot higher than 25, 30%. It's just, it's funny, like, because retail, you probably want like 80% gross margin or like, you know, if you're selling widgets, you know, if you don't watch Shark Tank, they always want it to be like, your cogs to be 20% of the sales price because you have so much marketing and other expense. So you just really have to look at the industry you're buying in before uh, working out whether the business is healthy or not. Yeah, and that's where it gets, that's where whoever's watching this in the future, this is where you got to investigate when you're, I guess, when you're defining your buy box, you're looking at this. So you understand the this, the construction sector, the home service sector is what, what, what's the margins? What, what, what does an average margin look like? And, and that's where I think people really need to spend time in the beginning, right? Once they say, okay, I think this sector is good. And what are the numbers? What would the numbers realistically look, look like in this? So as you're evaluating businesses, then you can see if this is a good fit. If the, if the number, the expectations are good. And then also right now, or, you know, if you're not getting seller financing, you're kind of screwed with the SBA rates. If you're using a 7A and it's a variable, sometimes you can get a, a fixed rate 7A, but people that had 7% money are now at 11, 11 and a half on some of these deals. So there's a lot of people hurting, I'm guessing right now, which in my mind might create some huge opportunities right now. Yeah, I'm interested, by the way, on the SBAs, are you seeing like four out of five SBAs are variable? Like what kind of ratio are you seeing fixed to variable? So I have, so 
what I do in my career or part of what I do is place SBA deals with different banks and that's my skill set. And so some banks are straight variable. They don't offer a fixed rate option. Some of them will offer fixed rates. For example, I have a bank right now that will do a five year fix at 8.99 when, when, uh, prime rate is eight and a half plus you can go as high as 2.75 on a margin. So you're 11 and a half percent rate, right? So 8.99 is not that bad today for a deal that this bank would do. So it, if it's a prime deal, the, 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 the sponsors, the borrowers are strong and it's a, and it's good. They have compensating factors and the industry is good. You're going to get fixed rate if you want it. Um, where you're not going to get fixed rate is some random type of business that like only one or two of the banks want it because it's, it's all what we call air ball or blue sky. There's no collateral. Mm -hmm. Then those deals tend to have a little bit higher margin on them. And that's how the banks price them. But we can get you fixed rate. Not a problem. Okay. I'm just interested. I know most, most are variable, but uh, I've seen a yeah. little bit of fixed, you know, rates out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, there's about eight, between eight, seven, eight point seven five to eight nine nine. You can get fixed on pretty good SBA deals that are, that are the candidates and there's compensating factors that are strong. And oftentimes if there is collateral, like if there is commercial real estate involved with the, the business acquisition, then it's easier to get fixed rate, but I can do uh, blue sky uh, or uh, air balls. They call them deals with no collateral fixed rate with some of the banks I work with. Okay. That's very interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I, de I derailed us. What was your question? No, no, me? no, no, this is good. Cause this is what people want to know. We're talking about what people want to know. And even like me, uh, you know, on the SBA side, and then I also help people, you know, start franchises. And sometimes I tell people, that, so a lot of people come to me and say, Oh, I want to buy a laundromat. Like that's their first thing. They the conversation. Okay. Well, what are you doing to find it? Like they can't find one. And I'm, and then I say, Oh, have you thought about a franchise? I think you should still look at business acquisition because you're getting cash flow day one and there's not the variables that you would have with a startup business. But, but I guess the point is, is that so many people are lost. They don't even know what sector to get into. And that's why having you on the show is, is invaluable because you're just, you know, your first acquisition was, um, the reason you did it is because your partner had a construction background. You wouldn't have done it. So that's, when we're talking about partnership, that's where partnership really makes sense. I know there's also consulting for equity and different strategies that you can put the right people together. Like that's where I feel like I would be strongest. Like I invested in a deal and I wasn't the operator. I own less than, you know, 20%. He got the SBA loan and I'll do those all day long if it's the right partner operator. Um, are so, you consulting for equity purely in those deals or are you putting in funds for the down payment? I put, I put in that one, I put in funds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, um, I don't have that much money, so I have to be creative, right? I can, <laughs> but, but, but so now I, I see that as more of a viable option. Like, Hey, what if we, we collected, put a group together and then we made strategic investments together. It's almost like a search fund, but more of like a, a small family office of entrepreneurs that want to grow their wealth and net worth. Cause I think like for me personally, like I need cash flow and so many real estate investors, I come from the real estate investing world. So, so many real estate investors, like our problem is, is yeah, we can go get property, but unless they're like really top producing Airbnbs, they're not going to cash flow if they're long-term rental that great. Right. And so we're, that's really a wealth, a long-term wealth play. But what I need today is more cash flow. And that's where the business acquisition, owning businesses is, is you create the cash flow so you can invest in long-term assets. Is that kind of how mm -hmm. you look at it as well? Yeah, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. I mean, why instead of making a collective, why don't you just go in with one one other person? You know, um, <laughs> this isn't a proposition necessarily. I'm just just just, it just throwing it out there. But <laughs> find someone go fifty fifty and and go for a business using the SBA scheme, which you know so well. Like you could get yeah. the best financing. You could you have the ability to create a lot of cash flow with one deal. Yeah. Well, the problem on my part is that I have a lot of operating companies that run losses. So it's hard for me to get SBA. So really what I look for is an operator that's bankable, that has really good W2 income right now, or, or looks good on paper compared to me, right? You see what I'm saying? I can mm -hmm. leverage them. So, but yeah, collectively, can you put the right pieces in, uh, put the, put the right pieces together? And that's, the, that's the real question. So like, because I have a lot of losses, it's hard to get the bank debt because they look at the SBA looks at global cash flow. Mm -hmm. So 
How do you get creative? Well, you get creative because James, let's say James looks good on paper. James could be the SBA buyer. I could own 19%. I don't have to go on the loan. So putting those type of pieces together, then you can collectively buy more businesses, businesses, right? Or what you're doing, which is even better, is you're just getting 60 to 100% seller finance and going into deals. That to me, that makes more sense. And we come up with a little bit of capital because we need a little bit of working capital in the beginning, right? But then we're getting seller finance complete seller finance deals, like you said, it makes more sense for them because if they're running the business correctly, usually they are wealthy and they don't want to get capital gains and pay 20% on that three three or $4 million sale, right? That's right. 800 grand. So this is making a lot of sense to me now. So it's just how you talk to people. And obviously when they talk to you, they're like, oh, they feel comfortable. This guy's not some Joe Schmo off the street. He mm -hmm. knows he knows business, he's smart. And they trust you because, oh, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of it comes down to that they want to leave their legacy in good hands also. That's important to them. That That's huge. And I, I don't <laughs> want people to go out and say things they don't mean. But if you truly care and you truly care about the business, like it's an amazing service you can provide by providing legacy to business owners and, you know, be a, a kind, good, caring person. Be just like, I, I care about your customers, your employees, your suppliers. Like if you sell a business to me, I will honor that. I'm not going to go change the name day one and start cutting, chopping people and sending people to other states because I want to grow aggressively and flip the business in three to five years. Like that is not my style. Um, but I think, you know, if you, if you can truly see what you're doing is providing a really valuable service of people entering that kind of final third of their life, then I think you actually helps you out a lot. Um, and I wanted to touch on one other point you said, you were talking about industries a while back, and I had a thought which is, if you are truly trying to take advantage of opportunities in front of me, you will not know everything about every industry, it's just impossible. So someone will probably bring you a business in an industry you've never experienced before. Um, I've looked at several of them over the last year and a half. but. The most important skill is learning. You may not know what the appropriate gross margin is, but you can have a you can still do a quick viability check by looking at the P and L, of course, balance sheet, but like looking at gross margin, looking at overheads, working out kind of what the business is netting, and then learning how to overlay debt service, like modeling that out. It, I think it's overwhelming if you've never done that before, but actually, it's a pretty simple formula in Excel. You know, it's equals PMT, and then you just need all of all the inputs, you know. And yeah, you, what would be useful for me? Stuff. Yeah, James, what would, you, would be useful for me is a really simplified spreadsheet where I just have to put like four or five inputs in, then I could get off the the, the tax returns of the business. That would be like because I'm not a, I'm not an Excel person, and so like the the easier it is for me, like okay, top line revenue, operating right, like just make it simple, and that. When it's simple, I can do it and it makes it easier. I remember I was like, hadn't bought a house in a while, a rental property. And I'm like, I'm just going to go buy. My goal was to buy like three additional doors, right? And I ended up buying six that year. Um, and they could have been duplexes or fourplexes or whatever. But the point being is I just created a simple process and I followed it, right? And so that's what I want for business acquisition is like, okay, I'm not the, I'm not a spreadsheet guy. I get business. I understand numbers, but I'm not like, I just want a simple like tool that I can like quickly evaluate based on the numbers. Um, even when I do SBA loans, you know, we, we need, we need, uh, we need, uh, three years of projections and the first year needs to be broken out for an SBA loan. So I give the, you know, the, the customer fills that out, the client, here's your month one, month two, month three, first month or first year is all broken out. And then year two and year three for projections. Um, so I try to simplify that because that's how SBA wants to see the loan. They want the, the projections. But from an acquisition standpoint, I'm like, okay, like, all right. So I'm looking at this business. Like, what are the, the five inputs I'm really looking at? I know it's simple, right? But most people, it overwhelms them. So we're looking at it. Here's the top line. This business was doing 3.4 million. You know, this was 10%. Um, so, he, you know, they were doing $340,000 of net right now. Okay, that's great. Okay. But now I got to roll in the new debt that I'm going to incur, whether it's seller finance or SBA. I mean, that's really the framework of what we have to see. Well, is that like phase one of like basic math and diligence is like, hey, this is what I'm looking at. And like, does this de deal even pencil out? And if it doesn't, what can I recalibrate? Cal Could I do like some kind of 
you know, I can pay your price, but I'm, you're not, I'm not paying any interest. I'm just doing principal pay down. Right. So you can get really creative. Mm -hmm. So why don't we talk about that a yeah. little bit? I think the formula is what you're provided often is PN, as a PL first. There's other things you ask for, but you, that will end with net income. What you need to know, do, um, is get to some sort of earnings. And so if you go through a business broker, they talk about SDE, sellers mm -hmm. discretionary earnings, which is kind of, throw everything back so you throw everything back to get to EBITDA which is interest tax depreciation amortization and then everything the seller makes as well to get it even higher but what I always try and teach in my classes at least is you need like that, that anchor point which is an earnings anchor so you've got net income you need to figure out what EBITDA is I prefer EBITDA because it is a, a more normalized state like if you do it based on seller's discretionary earnings like unless you are planning on being the owner operator of the business you're looking at you will have to pay someone to manage you know the store the company whatever you're buying and so i try and get to some sort of normalized ebitda level then i try and turn it into free cash flow by adding in some of the additional things that aren't factored in when you have an ebitda which is things like capital expenditure so you get to that free cash flow and once you have free cash flow, that's when you're at a point where you can work out how much space you have on your debt service. So it's the debt service coverage ratio, DSCR for listeners. And so once you know what your free cash flow is per year, you then need to work out in Excel what your debt service is going to be. And if it is a variable SBA, like you mentioned, a lot of them are, you probably need to stress test a little bit and add a, a higher interest rate in there than what you're getting just in case. And then you want to look at that ratio. So I prefer 1.5x or more. Uh, if you get to two, then I think it's a really nice spot to be in in terms of debt service coverage ratio. I know some SBA lenders are much more aggressive than that. I, you probably know better than me what some of them are offering right now, but I've seen definitely lower than that. Well, yeah, guidelines for SBA, not, not saying, that. so SBA doesn't make the loans, it's just they put out the guidelines and every bank interprets them differently and they ha every bank needs to use what they call prudent lending. And so the guidelines say you need a debt service coverage ratio of at least 1.15, which is extremely low. It's barely cash flow. <laughs> it's, it's scary uh, for me, 1.15, because what I've seen is once you typically take ownership of a business, often uh, you see like performance will dip a little before it, it goes up. And that's just, I think that's normal. So if, if your listeners do buy a business and that happens, I would, you don't panic. It's just that you adjusting to the business, the business adjusting to you, the person who's run it for 30 years is gone. Like that is totally normal. But like just a small decrease in revenue in that year one could see you not make your debt payments, which is a scary place to be in. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is a good, this is a great conversation so far because it's, um, it's, it's interesting. And I know people want this. People are like, Pretty much everybody I talk to, and maybe because I'm only talking to real estate investors and entrepreneurs, are like, I need to like get out of my W-2 if I'm they're in the W-2 and they need to do something or they don't need to, they want to do something. Are you trying to escape the W-2 rat race? Or have you always wanted to own your own business? Have you ever thought about owning a franchise? If so, FranUniversity.com can help. Our training program teaches you everything you need to know about franchise ownership. From choosing the right franchise to launching and running your business. We have the resources and specialists to help you from A to Z. You'll gain the skills and knowledge you need to succeed as a franchise owner. The best part? It's free to join. Go to FranUniversity.com. So let's, let's kind of dive back into uh, the retaining wall business. So you had the partner. You started negotiations. It was doing about 3.4 million in top line revenue. You started getting financials. Okay. And let's just say you didn't have a bunch of cash to, to, to put down. So how did you structure this? How much cash did you guys have to come up with? And tell us about the terms you, the seller uh, worked with you. So we, we ended up um, doing hundred percent seller financing on this deal. And the reason was we were going to do SBA, but the seller was in a rush which is which is a red flag just generally speaking but after kind of talking it through the seller had sold um, a lot of work and nashville's a booming market and so they needed some help um kind of fulfilling some of the work that had been sold so because of that we accelerated and ended up doing 100 percent seller financing i think um 
I'm trying to think of what would be valuable. Like what what I wish I did better with the first deal was because we were under a, a time crunch with it. I didn't do um, as good of a job on the like. There's a kind of a triage you do in the financial diligence stage where you take the QuickBooks or accounting software, you 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 bridge it to the tax financials, and then you also do a build up of cash uh, from the bank statements called a proof of cash, and you kind of triage the three three areas, and that that helps you get confidence um, and comfort that what you're seeing in QuickBooks is correct. And so we we rushed that a little bit, if I'm being entirely honest, and that's one of the main things I wish I did better. Wish I did better on the first deal, but that's a, a good point for your listeners. Like, make sure you do good financial diligence. I self performed. If you look at kind of the deals we've done, I've self performed diligence financial up until this point. But we've made a decision that going forwards, we're actually going to be using third parties to do it because we almost value that kind of extra set of eyes to to look at the financials for us. And James. Like when that 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 di- uh, that diligence is called um, uh, uh, quality of earnings. Is that kind of what you, you the report? Can you explain that diligence? What you would recommend somebody buying a business would do? Yeah, you can buy um, a quality of earnings kind of report, which is you you hire a firm to go and do this quality of earnings report for you. It's not always called that for some of the smaller businesses, but it's kind of one and the same, like the, the quality of earnings is probably the main component of financial diligence for, for most business purchases. My recommendation is for the smaller businesses, find a really good local CPA who you trust, who can do a basic financial diligence package. And then based on the business you're buying and the industry, you can kind of add bits like, oh, I'm a bit worried about this. I saw this, wasn't sure about this. Like that's kind of what I recommend. The only reason I recommend that is quality of earnings reports can get quite expensive. And so you could pay, again, totally depends on the size, but I mean, you're probably going to pay at least 20000 for a quality of earnings report. I, I'm, I'm thinking, um, I think that's what I've seen most recently, but like that can also go up as well. And if you hire a, a huge kind of big four company to do a quality of earnings, you're paying hundreds of thousands. So, so going back, thank you for that information. So going back to this retaining wall business, you closed on it with basically no money. <laughs> And, and, and so, uh, you had some AR accounts receivable that was coming in. So you knew there was some money coming in, but like, did you guys have a uh, reserve for any new expenditures? How did you stack that cash? What was the structure and what were the terms that the seller was willing to offer you? So we negotiated, uh, what we believed reasonable working capital to be to stay with the business on day one. And then we structured it as a 50% uh, seller finance note amortized over seven years at 4% interest and then a 50% deferred down payment. And so we paid that over time so that, so we've kind of got two tranches there that equal the hundred percent total. I think just to, just to pivot, I think a more typical transaction I'm seeing, if you're doing, if you're doing a seller finance route, what I've done in kind of later transactions, um, maybe like 20% down, maybe a 60% seller finance note. And then that final 20%, ideally you could get it as an earn out. Um, I've seen that happen several times. I've done it myself. Um, or maybe if the seller is not willing to do more than 60% seller financing, sometimes you can get in like a small piece of local bank debt as well to go on the capital Can you structure. explain an earn out and why it's beneficial for a buyer? Earnouts are good because what it's essentially saying is I'm paying you, you know, say a million dollars for your business, but I'm going to hold back 200K of it and I'm going to pay it. Let's just make it up over four years, 50K a year for four years if the business doesn't drop below 900K in revenue. And I mean, you can structure it however you want. There's no rules, but my preferred way of structuring it is not to use it uh, for any kind of malintent or anything. It's just a basic safety net for the buyer because, hey, we're stepping into this thing that is new to us and all your employees aren't used to us and all this other stuff. Like, I just want to protect against it dropping too much in those first few months, first year. And so by structuring like that earn out piece in, it just means if it does drop under that amount, you kind of get the business a little cheaper. I I think it's a pretty fair mechanism to put into a, a transaction. I like that. That's what I, I would definitely use that because it's like, hey, if you're t- if you, everything you have showed us is true, hitting this 900k of revenue or whatever that number is is very is you know should be a sure thing. So 
if you're not sure, you, you know, so they're basically putting kind of backing what they're saying in, in a certain degree for at least a little bit of, of skin in the deal. So I like that. So <clears throat> what, what, what would you have done differently on this deal? And what was the, what was the, what was the worst, what was the worst problem that you had with this deal that you were like, which could have been kind of a nightmare that you didn't foresee? So I saw this, I don't know if it was a meme or a tweet or something from someone. It said the people that need financial diligence the most support are people who have a finance background. And the reason is because you kind of go in and you think you know exactly what you're doing. Um, so I, I, if I had brought in an ex external help for that first deal, I believe I'd have paid less for the business um, because of, um, I, I just think it, we, I think we overpaid because we kind of rushed it. That's my belief. Um, but it, I think it's okay. Like we're, we're paying off the debt and I think the future will look bright for that business once we're out from one of the tranches that we discussed. Um, but like also it's one of those things like your listeners, if they go into this world, you will probably find that you've made mistakes in every deal. Mm -hmm. And the important thing is just to keep going, to don't stop and learn from your mistake. And so like, that's kind of what we've done. You know, um, each time we've done one, we've got better. Um, and now I'm thankfully in a position where I can help other people to kind of do that, do their transactions for themselves as well. Awesome. So a after the acquisition of the retaining wall company, you did what you did another acquisition roll up. Can you just tell us why and how you did that? See, I think you're referring to the, you're talking about the trucking company. Okay, the trucking company. It, 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 the trucking company was same seller. Um, it was being used as an additional. It was a separate company that was moving blocks for the retaining wall, but then with any spare capacity servicing other customers in the market. So we've just rolled it together into one entity. Essentially, it's just because it, it's such a key part of doing the retaining walls well is delivering the blocks at the right time to the right size. Got it. And so, so we've just, that, we've rationalized what, really there. Was that together in the acquisition from yeah, day that was, one? That was that was all lumped together. But then the set, the next transaction was the roof was a roofing company. Okay, um, and so the trucking company is that? Are you ramping up like third party business now too? Has that been fruitful or is it just no? Really we've, servicing we've focused. The... We've we've kind of rationalized it, and so we're focusing on servicing our block delivery. And then occasionally, I think we we're still servicing some people in the marketplace, but we've cut back a lot. So it's kind of that's why it's truly part of our block company now. The trucks that we have. So so this business, when you're acquiring it collectively, was doing three point four million mm -hmm. between the two entities, two companies. And so, where do you determine? Like you say, you probably overpaid for it. Did you pay like a two times multiplier of, mm -hmm. or or was it like eighty percent of? revenue how did you figure out like you know what's a good i guess it all depends on industry and stuff but if i'm looking at you know purchasing a business am i looking at like 80 percent of top line revenue for this type of industry is usually you know a, a good purchase price or like you know because some people some industries are two or three times you know cash flow how do you how do you you know what's rules of thumbs on this type of uh, yeah great great question um i don't recommend paying over three times EBITDA for a, a company in construction, for sure. Um, there's several things you have to factor in. You have to look at the quality of the customers, you know, supply relationships, like what the future looks like. Just there's so many factors. It's hard to say for sure. But yeah, construction, I wouldn't really pay over three times EBITDA as a rule. Um, there are, as you move into other types of kind of home services spaces, you can pay more, especially when like revenue is, recurring contracted things like that that makes the business more valuable and also like the thing with construction is quite cyclical with the economy so again that makes some construction businesses less valuable than i don't know let's say an hvac business for example you're going to need your hvac repaired whether it's we're in a recession or the market's booming you know so it's it's different to certain types of construction companies that rise and fall with the economy and then so so now you have this business up and running and you're getting, you're paying off debt. And when that first tranche is paid off, you guys will be crushing it on the business. It'll take a little bit of time, but that's where the real cash flow is going to come. Mm -hmm. So then, then you bought a roofing company. 
And and I'm assuming that's the same market in your Nashville market. Nashville, yes. Our CPA found this deal or referred it to us, so we're very grateful to him. Um, he, uh, I mean, we, we, we looked at it together and we just did it with the same partnership. I did it with the same partner. And um, this one was about 20% down, about 60% seller financing and about 20% earn out. But this company did about 4.3 million revenue, 4.3 to 4.5. It's got a slightly funny uh, financial year, so it depends which period you're looking at, but in that ballpark. But this company has a huge amount of growth potential. I'm very excited about the future on this business. It has is grown already. I think we're going to hit 7 million this year, and the next year we'll do more again. So it's got a, a, a very strong growth curve on it, and uh, the future looks really bright for that business. So, so like in... Is your thought process now just stay in the market and develop different um, platforms? So like the next acquisition, you know, logically could be like an HVAC company or a landscaping company that does the, the tree trimming. What What's the thought process as you're doing multiple businesses? Is it better to have like a platform in the same market, would you say? Yeah, so my goal, when I set out to do this, I, I'm, I'm the kind of a goal person, so I need to know roughly what I'm aiming at, even if that goal moves or whatever. I need to know, like, this is directionally where I'm heading. And so I set out. I had no no model of this in front of me, like anyone that's done it, but I was like, I'm going to try and build a hold co of, um, you know, portfolio companies that do a combined $100 million in revenue. And again, revenue, I don't really care about revenue. It's a kind of a vanity metric but it's easily understood by people and it's just a nice round number and a good target. And so I guess I am doing what you, you're suggesting, which is we will probably branch out into other types of home services, first and foremost, less construction, probably more home services that, you know, maybe can go to market together, but be part of kind of a master brand, a holding company that, and, and they'll probably primarily be in middle Tennessee is my assumption, but who knows? There's been some interesting opportunities. I always tell people it's really hard to do the first deal. It took me two years to kind of get to that point where I was able to jump in and do it. But once you've done one, you don't, you're don't. you not a tire kicker anymore. There's a lot of people in this space that say they want to buy businesses that probably never will. Mm -hmm. And so once you've done one, people bring you deals. That's just, just how it works. That's awesome. Talk to us a little bit about your five-week, is it a live intensive type program online on Zoom? Talk to us about that if somebody's interested in, in, in learning more so they can be a, a, be ready to buy a business. Yeah, so I'm, um, you know, we're recording this towards the end of September 2023. I'll probably do one more cohort before the end of the year, um, dates TBD. But if you're interested in it, uh, reach out to me at bizbuyingbrit on Instagram. Um, and what it is, we do a five-week live training. I teach on Tuesday nights. So it's five weeks of live course, and the live piece works really well because it's not pre-recorded. So sometimes if a student has a question, we can just kind of pause the lesson, we open Excel, and we you know, do some calculations, whatever. Like I'm here to kind of serve the students as much as possible so they understand the theory of buying a business. And what, we, what we're trying to do is build like the pragmatic solution on the market. Um, you know, like what do you really need to know from you know, sourcing a deal all the way through to operating the business those first 100 days and beyond, like or in five weeks. But as part of my course, you also get access to my business buying community, which is really just the start of a mastermind group, which is um, we have a WhatsApp group um, where we can all communicate with, with each other. We have 23 members at the moment. And then every Thursday lunchtime, I have an hour blocked out in my calendar every Thursday lunchtime where anyone who's been one of my students can jump on to the office hours and we just like kick around deals and questions. Sometimes we go over some of the material if we want to revisit it. Like this week just gone, we looked at a deal that one of my students had been looking at and we worked out together if it was a good or a bad deal and that one was a bad deal. But like that's the kind of stuff that we do in my community. So would love to connect with anyone who's interested in that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's what I think everybody needs really is just like, Deal or no deal, why or why not? And that's really how I, I think I, I would learn best too. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's fantastic to, to, to do that and to to understand, like, I think a lot of people in theory want to buy a business, but they don't even understand. But what, the, what I thought about too in, in this conversation was it sounds like 
the real business deals that are getting structured aren't the ones that are advertised on biz by sell typically, right? They're deals that you're either your CPA referred one. The first company was that online or how did you find that one? First one was a business owner friend. Second one was CPA. And third one was an independent uh, business consultant that I met at a networking event. So it really goes to show that the power of kind of networking locally is, you know, like the, what the power of that can do. You know, like, yes, you can go through bro brokers. Uh, yes, you can go to biz by sale. Yes, you can do cold outreach. But actually, if you tell the right people you're looking, uh, sometimes things are presented to you that other people aren't looking at. And they're, they're the types of opportunities I like best. Yeah, perfect. That makes a lot of sense. And that's how you're able to, if there's no, you know, not not, not to badmouth business brokers, because I think they definitely do a great job, most of them. But if you're an investor and you can be direct and there's no middleman and you're able to then, then construct an offer because you have a relationship with the seller and just say, hey, here's how it's a win-win for both of us. We, you know, if we go SBA, it's going to take us 90, 120 days to get this thing done. It's going to be a hassle. You have to get all your financials versus do it this way. And it's a win for us because we don't have to come up with any equity or very little. So I love it. That, that makes a lot of sense. I think this was a great episode. I think it, you're going to encourage a lot of people to, to, you know, just know it's going to take you maybe two years to get your first business. But that first business that you do get, could be that business that helps you leave your W-2 job, right? Because most of us are um, chained to our W-2 job because we need the money to pay our bills to put food on the table. This is a way that you can do it. And it does take some work and it's not like all of a sudden you're going to just own a business unless you have a lot of cash and you can be a, an investor in a deal, which is possible, right? But you have to, you still have to know enough to, to, to have an operator you know, like, and trust, right? Like if I had a million bucks sitting around right now, and James had a deal. Now that I know him, right, I might be interested in investing. But you're you still need to learn the what's a good deal and what's not a good deal. Just like investing in real estate, right? Like we've all done that one deal where we thought we we're going to make a hundred grand on a flip, and we ended up losing fifty. Um, so same thing with businesses. It's you know you, you can easily buy a bad business and regret it the rest of your life. So it's but thank true. you so much, James. That was so. Where, where can people? What's your Instagram handle? Yeah, it's at bizbuyingbrit, at bizbuyingbrit. So I'm the business buying Brit. And that's probably the best place to uh, you know connect with me. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. On, I know I did. Hey, guys. Bo Exine here. If you enjoyed what you saw, please subscribe to this channel. We talk all things financing. I've been in the lending industry for over 20 years, and I'm happy to answer your questions and provide great content.